Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth installment in our webinar series sponsored by the Microbiology Consortium and the Philippine Society for Microbiology. The first four webinars featured talks about remote learning in the context of teaching microbiology courses. Today, we will shift gears and listen to experts talk about immunology and viruses. To officially open this morning's program, we'll have a video message from the current MC coordinator for Mindanao, who's also the vice chancellor of Mindanao State University IIT and PSM Outstanding Microbiologist Awardee, Dr. Franco G. Tebes. To our honorable resource speakers, experts in their own rights, who will be properly introduced later to academician Dr. Asuncion Quebremundo, Chair of the Microbiology Consortium of the Philippine Society for Microbiology, members of the Microbiology Consortium Council, participants, good morning. COVID-19 has practically affected all aspects of our lives. What could have been a very nice face-to-face -face seminar is now replaced by this online webinar. But that makes our activity today more exciting as each one of us is actually interacting through a computer and of course, the internet. Indeed, we are probably closer to entering the fourth industrial revolution already. The topics to be tackled by our two resource speakers are extremely relevant to our fight against COVID-19. Three questions can be asked. One, can antibody testing be used for the diagnosis of a new disease, COVID-19, caused by a novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2, as in other viral infections. Second, how can specific types of antibodies be used with increased sensitivity for the detection of SARS-CoV-2? And lastly, what are the pros and cons in using antibody-based COVID-19 diagnostics? I believe that these questions will be addressed very effectively by our two experts. So, let us all relax, but at the same time, be attentive to the lectures that will be given. In behalf of the Microbiology Consortium, I wish to welcome you all as we formally open this morning's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Fran. Our first speaker is a BS Biology Magna Cum Laude graduate of UP Manila. She's also one of the pioneer graduates of our sole dual degree program, that is the MD PhD in Molecular Medicine, where she was feted with the following awards. The most outstanding MD PhD graduate and the most outstanding MD-PhD dissertation. Currently, she is an associate professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology in UP Manila's College of Public Health and faculty in charge of UP Manila's Philippine Study Group on Emerging Biological and Bioactive Agents. Today, she will give us an overview on antibody testing for the diagnosis of viral infections. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Festo Monica M. Kimakosa. Hi, good morning. Do you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Doc. Okay, so I'll just be sharing my slide. Okay. Let me adjust. 
Okay. Now you can see my slide. Yes, Pa. Okay, thank you. So good day, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Microbiology Consortium for inviting me this morning. I am tasked today to give a brief overview on immunoassays in general, uh, including your antibody testing for the diagnosis of viral infections. I hope my presentation would set the tone for and make us appreciate more the next speaker's pivotal research. So here's the outline of what I will be discussing this morning. So before we dwell on the laboratory aspects of immunoassays, I would like to emphasize two important concepts regarding making a diagnosis in the clinical setting. First, the diagnosis of a microbial infection begins with an assessment of clinical and epidemiologic features, which leads to the formulation of a diagnostic hypothesis by the clinician. This clinical diagnosis suggests several possible etiologic agents based on the clinician's knowledge of infectious syndromes and their courses. The specific cause, or what we call etiologic diagnosis, is then established by the application of microbiologic laboratory methods, a combination of science and art on the part of the clinician and the laboratory worker is required. On one hand, the clinician must select the appropriate tests and specimens to be processed and where appropriate, suggest the suspected etiologic agents to the laboratory. And on the other hand, the laboratory scientists must use the methods that will demonstrate the probable agents and be prepared to explore other possibilities suggested by the clinical situation or by the findings of the laboratory examinations. In all situation, clinical diagnosis or the clinical question precedes and guides the approach to etiologic diagnosis. The second crucial concept regarding diagnostic approaches is the vital role played by the specimen itself and the process of its collection from the patient. Appropriate specimens must be properly collected from the right site and at the right time to be able to arrive at the correct or most probable diagnosis. If the specimen is not appropriately chosen and or collected, no degree of laboratory skill can rectify this error. Failure at the level of specimen collection is in fact the most common reason for failing to establish an etiologic diagnosis or worse, for suggesting a wrong diagnosis. Now in earlier times when laboratory diagnostic testing was in its infancy, diagnosis of diseases related to viral infections, both in humans and even in veterinary settings, was achieved mainly on the basis of clinical history, asking for signs and symptoms, um, checking physical examination, and some form of gross pathology, and sometimes uh, instituting histopathology. In addition to the fact that the diagnosis is mostly clinical in nature, the disease course of most viral infections are also short-lived or self-limiting in most immunocompetent individuals. So the patient had already recovered even before the results of the lab tests are available. And the management of majority of these viral infections is purely supportive. Take, for example, gastroenteritis or diarrhea causing viral infections are treated not with an antiviral, but only to replenish fluid loss during the disease course. If there is a fever in the patient, we give antipyretics like paracetamol. We also conduct some form of isolation of, indif of infected individuals for contagious diseases. So in all these contexts, laboratory test results were viewed as confirmatory data before, no? But now, lab diagnosis of viral infection has moved into the mainstream of clinical care because it now guides the management and provide information on prognosis. That is what could be the likely course or outcome of the patient. There are also more commercially available antiviral uh, therapeutics with specific indications and antiviral properties effective against particular pathogens. So, however, most of these agents are quite expensive and some has unwanted uh, side effects. So a clinician must be careful in selecting the eligible patients to receive the drug. Hence, uh, you have to have a laboratory confirmed evidence of the infection before giving these drugs to those patients. And once thought as short-lived infections, no? viral infections are seen now to cause chronic forms, as in the case of human immunodeficiency virus and hepatitis virus infection. Management and control of these infections 
largely depends on some laboratory workups. The importance of establishing a specific viral disease is also seen among recipients of modern day medical interventions, such as administration of chemotherapeutic drugs or cancer patients for cancer patients and receiving of immunosuppression drugs following an organ transplantation. These interventions could render the recipient immunocompromised. And with immunosuppression, there is an increased risk of acquiring opportunistic viral infections or unusual manifestation of otherwise common viral diseases. So ascertaining viral infections in the host has again important implications in the patient's management and prognosis. Technological developments and innovations with regards to diagnostics have allowed us also to detect recent and even past viral infections without the need for very laborious and expensive traditional method of viral isolation in culture. And lastly, surveillance of specific viral pathogens have public health implications. Just take, for example, the documentation of a vaccine-preventable viral diseases in a locality. This will drive the need for extensive vaccination campaigns. So the laboratory methods available for viral diagnosis can be generally classified into four. First is your viral culture, second your viral nucleic acid detection, you have your viral antigen detection, and virus-specific uh, antibody testing. The first three um, methods focus, focuses on the detection of the virus or its components, while the last one is testing of the product of immune response against exposure to the virus. As viruses cannot survive outside the host, so in viral culture, samples are incubated with host cells, and T cells are monitored for weeks for the appearance of characteristic viral cytopathic effects, such as seen in the right photo. Let me use my laser pointer here. So right photo, which demonstrates syncytial formation, fusion of cells in paramyxovirus infection. Because the turnaround time is slow and the whole process is expensive, no? When with viral culture, there is need to set up and maintain appropriate laboratory facility and equipment, as well as to train laboratory workers for accurate identification of these cytopathic effects. Because of these, um, viral culture studies are often peripheral to clinical decision making. However, it remains valuable because it is the only method capable of providing a viable isolate that can be used for further characterization. So your viral culture techniques have allowed us to identify the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 as the etiologic agent of the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember that it was dubbed as pneumonia with a known cause back in late 2019. Now methods on viral nucleic de acid detection with or without sequencing capitalizes on the complementary base pairing of your nucleic acids, your adenine, binds thymine, your guanine, binds your cytosine, as well as the development of various platforms based on the polymerase chain reactions, including your reverse transcription PCR and real-time or quantitative PCR. The quality and performance of these assays vary widely, but it offers speed and may provide real-time estimate of viral load compared to viral culture. Now, your viral load assays for uh, HIV and hepatitis C virus, which are important in the management of these infections, are examples of quantitative nucleic acid detection techniques. So available also are your multiplex techniques, wherein multiple pathogens can be detected in just a single PCR run. These are available for the most common respiratory and neurologic pathogens in a so-called respiratory and neurologic panels. And now we've come to the meat of our discussion. Your viral antigen detection and your virus-specific antibody testing can be clumped together as immunoassays for the techniques employed in these tests are based on the affinity binding between your antibody and its corresponding antigen. So let us first define what these um, terminologies are. So classically, antigens are defined as any agent that gives rise to antibody formation specific to that agent when introduced to a living cell system containing immunocompetent cells. But more recently, uh, any agent is considered an antigen if it can be recognized by any component of the immune system, not just the antibody. Now your antigens 
maybe a carbohydrate moiety, less often nucleic acid or lipid component. But most antigenic determinants associated with long-lasting immunity are made of peptides or proteins. And these antigens may be a structural part of the virus or its products. On the other hand, antibodies are proteins synthesized by immune cells called plasma cells that recognize and bind to antibodies. This slide shows the basic structure of an antibody. It has two heavy chain and two light chains you know, composed of your variable denoted as V and constant denoted as C regions held together by your uh, disulfide bonds. Yeah. So the antibody also has two fragments based on papain digestion. These are designated as the fab, the light blue ones, and the FC fragments. So the fab or fragment antibody binding participates in antibody binding to its antigen. On the other hand, the FC or fragment constant is responsible for the effector functions of the antibody in vivo. There are five different classes of immunoglobulins, your IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, and IgE, differing in the constant regions of their heavy chains, your gamma, mu, alpha, uh, delta, and epsilon. No? And that gives rise to the different effector functions of each of these immunoglobulin class. As illustrated here, the interaction between your antigen and antibody does not involve the entirety of these two molecules. The epitope here, that is the um, antigenic surface specifically recognized by the fab fragment of the antibody, which is in turn called or referred to as your paratope. Note also that the epitope of a particular antigen may be linear corresponding to contiguous peptidic amino acid sequence or conformational, referring to the exposed antigenic surface brought by folding of the protein. This molecular model beautifully demonstrates the specificity of your antigen-antibody interaction. See how the epitope of your antigen and the paratope of your fab complements each other, similar to a lock and key model. No? So both of them has a specific pattern so that they would fit. Though there is a confirmation that must be assumed so that the interaction is optimal, it, uh, your antibody-antigen um, interaction is not at all rigid. No? There is still some degree of flexibility in these structures for the interaction of antigens and antibodies. So what happens when an antibody interacts with its corresponding antigen? So in vivo, this specificity of antigen-antibody interaction facilitates the clearance of specific pathogens in the body through one, neutralization, that is the virus cannot infect the whole cell or the secreted toxin cannot exert its uh, harmful effect. Second, opsonization, that is the tagging of the pathogen for phagocytosis of um, by phagocytes like your macrophages and neutrophils. And lastly, the activation of serum proteins called complement system that result in the formation of membrane attack complex. All of these are directed to clear the pathogens of the body. But for diagnostics, this selective binding nature of antibody allows the specific detection of target molecules, even with very low concentrations and in complex biological matrices, such as whole blood, serum, and other biological fluids. This specificity and selectivity is what we exploit in immunoassays. And here presented are tables no, of some of the examples of immunoassays. The field of immunoassay development is very dynamic and a lot of uh, immunoassays are still being developed. This list is in no way exhaustive. I have only uh, limited my discussion on the most commonly employed platforms. And most of these assays can either detect an antigen or an antibody in a sample depending on the format or the setup of the experiment. But what revolutionized immunoassays is the development of monoclonal antibodies. These reagents are highly specific in their binding to antigen and once developed, they provide a virtually inexhaustible supply of the same material for test consistency. 
production of monoclonal antibodies begins with the immunization of an animal, example, or your mice and rabbit, with antigen of interest and subsequent harvesting of the host spleen. Isolated spleen cells or splenocytes are fused to myeloma cells, which are immortalized, malignant, cancerous plasma cells. Recall that your plasma cells synthesize antibodies. So these immortalized uh, plasma cells only um, produce antibodies as long as it is viable. So the fusion of your splenocytes and your myeloma cell uh, brings the clonal expansion in antibody production. The clones are then screened and selected on the basis of antigen specificity and immunoglobulin class. Selected high producing clones are scaled up and expanded to produce the, the desired antibodies. And these monoclonal antibodies are modified. They are either conjugated to latex bead or conjugated with a fluorescent chemical or an enzyme, giving rise to the different detection systems of immunoassay, which we will be briefly describing in the next few slides. So almost every technique that has been developed is based on the selection of an amplification method, which will improve the sensitivity of measurement of the antibody-antigen interaction. So in your agglutination assays, your agglutination is the development of antigen-antibody complexes in the form of particle clumps or agglutinates due to the interaction between an insoluble form of antigen and its soluble and specific antibodies. So the latex particles um, depicted here as spheres are coated with either the target antigens if you want to detect antibodies or it could be also um, conjugated in the latex uh, particles or your specific antibodies for you to detect specific antigen of interest. So when incubated in the presence of patient serum containing the analyte, so at the first at the top illustration, if the serum contains the antibodies, in the bottom, if, the, if we want to detect antigen, no, the latex particles forms clamps that become visible to the naked eye, just like this one. Okay, so you will see there's clumping of those uh, beads. Now, this latex agglutination test for specific antibody testing, however, are subject to a prozone effect wherein high levels of antibody in patient serum can generate a falsely negative result due to saturation of all antibody binding sites and minimal agglutination. Now, let's go to another detection uh, system, your fluorescence immunoassays or immunofluorescence. It is an antigen detection test that is used primarily on frozen tissue sections, cell smears, or cultured cells. Antigen is detected through the binding of a sample matrix of, of fluorochrome labeled here, agent-specific antibody. So this fluorochrome conjugated to the uh, monoclonal antibody absorbs ultraviolet light and of a defined wavelength, but emits light at a higher wavelength. So the emitted light is detected optically with a special microscope, you know, your fluorescence microscope, equipped with filters specific for the emission wavelength of the fluorochrome. So the fluorochrome can be uh, bound directly to the agent-specific antibody, as in, and in the left picture, it's a direct immunofluorescence, or it can be a touch, like in this right, at the right side, you know, the right picture, can be attached to an anti-immunoglobulin uh, uh, molecule that recognizes the agent-specific antibody as in your indirect immunofluorescence. So this platform requires nga, a fluorescence microscope and extensive training and judgment to interpret the results as well. So it is likewise not suited for high volume testing. Now in ELISA or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, the antigen of interest is a touch, or again, a touch in um, a solid substrate, typically the wells of a polystyrene or polyvinyl microtiter plates, as opposed to your fluorescence immunoassay where the detector antibody is conjugated with fluorochrome. So in ELISA, the detector antibody is conjugated with an enzyme. Typically, the enzymes are your harsh radius peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase. So this enzyme catalyzes a chromogenic reaction displayed here, for example, for um, uh, an example of a chromogenic reaction that is there is a color change no? involving an appropriate organic substrate. Uh, in this illustration, it's a tetrametal benzidine, uh, such that the intensity 
of the colored uh, product is directly related to the amount of antigen antibody present in the original sample. This color change is assessed visually or read by a spectrophotometer. Now, there exist different forms of your ELISA. We have your direct, indirect, sandwich, and competitive ELISA. So the simplest ELISA format is a direct ELISA. So uh, the virus or a soluble viral uh, antigens from the specimen are allowed to bind to the polystyrene plate, just like in the first picture. The enzyme labeled antiviral antibody, the detector antibody, is then added. And washing steps are necessary to remove unbound detector antibody. If the antigen detector antibody is um, present, you know, so the color change will occur when the organic substrate is added. Now, uh, your indirect ELISA is another uh, format of your um, ELISA, but in this uh, format, uh, there is achievement of a greater analytical sensitivity. So in this format, the detector antibody is unlabeled. So uh, your same process with the direct ELISA, you have your samples, attach it to the wells. You now your detector antibody, your primary antibody is unlabeled. But there is a second labeled antibody, which is species specific anti immunoglobulin, and it is added as the indicator antibody. So, again, if that interactions are present and uh, the substrate, the chromogenic substrate, is, um, is included in the, uh, in the setup, then there would be a color change, and that would um, be an evidence that there is your uh, analyte. Now, there is also a format called sandwich ELISA. So from the word itself, the, the analyte that you want to detect is sandwiched between two um, uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. So there is a primary antibody first um, bound to the wells. Then you put in your samples. Okay? And then another, um, your detector antibody that recognizes the different site of that antigen is added to the samples. And when you put the chromogenic uh, substrate, then there would be a color change. So that is, again, an evidence that your, your sample contains their um, antigen or antibody of interest. Now, for uh, the last format for ELISA is your competitive ELISA. So in this format, the capture antibody is first incubated in solution with a sample containing antigen. The antigen antibody mixture is then added to the microtiter well, which is coated with known quantity of antigen. So the more antigen present in the sample, the less free antibody uh, will be available to bind the antigen coated well. After the well is washed, you know, the enzyme conjugated anti-immunoglobulin antibody is added to determine the amount of the capture antibody bound to the well. So the higher the concentration of the antigen in the sample, the lower the absorbance. Hence, unlike other formats of ELISA, the intensity read out of competitive ELISA is indirectly proportional to the amount of the substance being detected. Now, with all such assays, uh, extensive uh, validation testing must be carried out to determine the cut of values of these tests, which define your diagnostic sensitivity and diagnostic specificity, which we will be discussing later. Any antigenic variation of the virus target in the specific epitopes recognized by your specific monoclonal antibodies can lead to loss of binding and loss of test sensitivity, leading to false negative results. Now, in another uh, detection system you know, for your immunoassay is your chemiluminescence immunoassay. These are emerging technologies now. Now, your chemiluminescence is defined as the emission of electromagnetic radiation caused by a chemical reaction to produce visible light. So chemiluminescence immunoassay, or CLIA, is an assay that combines chemiluminescence technique with immunochemical reaction. So similar with other labeled immunoassays, you know, your um, antibodies, your monoclonal antibodies in CLIA utilize chemical probes, which could generate light emission through chemical reaction to label antibodies. So there are uh, general two forms of this um, uh, detection system. First is uh, your label. Um, directly is the chemical directly involved in light emission reaction. So in this kind of chemical, uh, in this kind of uh, 
chemical with special structure can transfer to an excited state through chemical reactions. So the photons would be released when the chemical fell to ground state from the excited state. So the typical chemical in, uh, in this um, type of assay is your acridinium ester and its derivative. So exposure of an acridinium ester label to an alkaline hydrogen peroxide solution triggers a flash of light. Now, there's also another uh, form or type of your CLIA, which is your um, enzyme catalyzed light emission reaction. So this type of chemiluminescence utilizes enzymes to label antibodies. So technically speaking, it is an enzyme-linked immunoassay as well that uses luminescent chemical as substrate instead of a chromogen. So the most widely used enzymes in your ELISA, uh, horseradish and peroxid, horseradish peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase are also, they also have uh, a luminescent substrate. No? And an example of that is luminol. So luminol is a very common chemiluminescent substrate used for detection of your horseradish peroxidase. So your HRP, horseradish peroxidase, catalyzes the decomposition of luminol. No, in the presence of uh, peroxide to produce an excited state of uh, intermediate and then flashes of visible light is emitted to decay of the singlet intermediate. Then uh, another uh, emerging uh, platform or detection system is your electrochemiluminescence uh, immunoassay. So um, you can consider this as a uh, uh, a subtype of your chemiluminescence, no? But uh, your electrochemiluminescence is a kind of luminescence uh, um, that produce during electrochemical reactions in solution. So in this method, electrochemically generated intermediates undergo a highly exergonic reaction to produce an excited state that then emits light upon relaxation to a lower level state. So the wavelength of the emitted light corresponds to the energy gap between these two these two states this phenomenon is applied in with uh, immunochemical reactions um, giving birth to the uh, electrochemical luminescence immunoassay so the common uh, eclia or the electrochemical luminescence uh, immunoassay system utilizes your ruthenium trisbipyridine you know, bpy as an antibody label so it involves electron transfer reactions of oxidized um, ruthenium and reduced uh, ruthenium to produce an excited state, this one, this uh, form of your ruthenium, which is a stable uh, species which decays to the ground state by emitting a 620 nanometer orange emission. So what is unique with ECLEA is that the, the reagent is regenerated with specific voltage application and thus can be recycled. So your ruthenium can be um, electrogenerated from the ones that was um, uh, formed earlier by reduction at approximately uh, negative 1.3 voltage and oxidation at approximately positive 1.3 voltage. So this system is reported to have ultra high sensitivity and specificity. And we will be hearing more ab about this method in the next speaker. Yeah. So um, the formats that I've discussed about ELISA, the direct, indirect sandwich and competition, uh, this can also be applied in the different uh, detection systems of your chemiluminescence or your electrochemiluminescence assay. So in a way, no, your um, immunoassays are a combination of uh, different your detection system in these formats, giving rise to a very specific immunoassays. And all of the immunoassays can be applied to uh, antigen or antibody detection. Another platform of your um, immunoassays, and I think it's uh, one of the um, good things that are being developed now, no, is your immunochromatographic uh, assays. And, and this, um, these are sometimes called your lateral flow assays. No? So in, in this method, it, um, it simply refers to the migration of your antigen or antigen antibody complexes through a filter matrix or in a lateral flow format, for example, using nitrocellulose strips. So in most formats of uh, antigen detection using lateral flow immunoassay, the samples, for example, here is loaded 
no? and is allowed to interact in the conjugation pad where a labeled antibody binds to the antigen of interest. So through capillary action, the antigen-antibody complexes migrate along the strip until they are immobilized, as in here, immobilized by an unlabeled antibody bound to the strip. So there are non-relevant uh, antibodies included in the assay to serve as controls. The results are seen as colored spots or bands as one of the test reagents is conjugated to colloidal, colloidal, colloidal gold or a chromogenic substance. So this test format is specially convenient for point of care testing. They are sometimes referred to as a rapid antibody test or rapid antigen test because of the rapidness of the results. And the test process is simple. And it, kasi, ano, um, you can do it at the, at the clinics lang. At, um, anyway, it's just like a, uh, a pregnancy kit. No? And each test unit contains both positive and negative controls to assess test validity. So example of this um, format is the detection of your NS1 antigen in dengue infection. There's also a... Um, um, uh, of this platform, they are developing also something like this for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 diagnosis. So this format, as I uh, what I have discussed earlier, is for the antigen. But this format can also be utilized in antibody detection. No? So uh, in this um, particular example, a patient's specimen is mixed with a test buffer, so as shown here. And this mixture is applied to the sample loading pad. The antibody present in the sample reacts with labeled antigen. So for example, here is a gold conjugated uh, antigen from your SARS-CoV-2. You might have heard of the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. It's very popular. It's the most popular uh, um, antigen of your SARS-CoV-2. So most of the um, immunochromatographic assays that um, would like to test for antibodies against uh, COVID is uh, they have spike proteins no, as their antigens in their, uh, in their assays. So your, um, the antibody present in the sample reacts with the labeled antigens on the strip. And the uh, antigen antibody detector conjugate complexes are drawn along the test strip by capillary action, uh, just like the ones in the antigen test. And uh, these are captured by specific antibodies in the test area, giving rise to a visible line spot. Uh, and uh, non-relevant antibodies, again, also serve as controls. You know? So this type of testing is not only available or being developed for SARS-CoV-2, but this, um, this type of assays are already in use for rapid HIV antibody tests in serum, saliva, or even in oral mucosal transudates. So all immunoassays that I have discussed thus far can be applied to detection of your antigen or antibodies. But as I mentioned earlier, unlike the first three methods of viral diagnosis, your culture, nucleic acid, and antigen detection, antibody testing detects the immune response against exposure to the virus. And the presence of such uh, virus-specific antibodies can mean one of the three things. You could have past exposure to a virus. There is the presence of a virus to link it to clinical event, a more acute, a recent infection. And also um, this antibody, uh, presence of antibodies could um, give us information about the person's response to vaccination. Now, there are um, methods that are specific for antibody testing alone, no? As uh, just like your neutralization assay. So as virus isolation is considered the gold standard for detection of virus against which other assays must be compared, the neutralization assay test has historically been the gold standard when available for detection and quantitation of virus-specific neutralizing antibody. So your neutralizing antibody um, attracts great interest because it is considered a direct correlate of protective antibody in vivo because these neutralizing antibodies can prevent the virus from initiating an infection in a susceptible cell. The growth of the virus is detected by its ability to kill the cell um, using your uh, measurement or observing cytopathic effect here in neutralization assay or its ability to produce antigen in the infected cells. So the disadvantages of uh, your serum neutralization test 
are that they are relatively slow to generate a result. They require production of infectious virus for the test and have a constant high overhead cost in maintaining self culture facilities for the test. Now there is a variation called a plaque reduction neutralization test. In this method, a challenge dose of infectious virus is mixed with a serial dilution of patient serum. After incubation, um, the mixture is inoculated to the cell culture monolayers. Most often, the monolayer is overlaid with a semi-solid uh, medium to facilitate the production of virus-infected foci or plaques here, shown as um, parang white uh, spots in this um, uh, figure. No? After a defined incubation period, the monolayers are fixed and stained, and the virus-induced plaques are counted. So um, if there is no antibody, there would be... Um, uh, observation of many formation of plaques, but there, if there is an antibody that neutralizes the virus, there would be a reduction in those plaque formation. So the end point is the dilution of the patient serum that reduces plaque formation by 90%. Then another um, unique testing for your uh, antibodies, you know, for the detection of your antibodies or your Western blotting test. So this um, particular assay uh, simultaneously but independently measure antibodies against several proteins of the agent of, of interest. So in here, uh, the concentrated virus is solubilized and uh, the constituent proteins are separated into discrete bands according to their molecular mass. So your, uh, through your sodium dodecyl um, SDS page. So then uh, the separated proteins are transferred electrophoretically or blotted onto nitrocellulose to immobilize them. Then the, the test serum is allowed to bind to the uh, viral proteins on the membrane. And the presence of those uh, antibodies you know, specific for that viral proteins are demonstrated using a labeled uh, anti-species antibody. Most of the time, it's an enzyme labeled um, uh, anti-species antibody. Thus, this immunoblotting permits demonstration of antibodies to some or all of the proteins of any given virus. And uh, this can be useful no, in monitoring the presence of antibodies to different antigens at different stages of infection. Although this uh, procedure is not routinely used in diagnostic setting with viruses, Western blots were central to the identification of immunogenic proteins in a variety of viruses. So Western blots are more of a qualitative test than a quantitative one and are not easily standardized from laboratory to laboratory. So your, um, it has utility with, uh, as the confirmatory test for HIV infection. Now, I've been discussing a lot about immunoassays, but there are a lot of things that we have to consider you know, when uh, which of these should we order, which of these should be um, employed in a specific uh, patient at a specific time. So um, to understand that, um, please, um, uh, um, shown here or um, represented here in this uh, slide is a simplified course of an acute virus infection. So it's a general picture, no? We can appreciate here that the stage where the patient is encountered along the disease course would indicate the optimal method for viral diagnosis. Why? Because following transmission, so there is uh, the virus entered the body, the virus starts to multiply. And after an incubation period, clinical symptoms appear with simultaneous shed, shedding of your infectious virus. So at this stage, there is an advantage of use uh, to use methods that detect the virus or its component because your virus-specific antibodies appear somewhat later pa, for some days or weeks. When the virus-specific antibody production reaches the level of detection, at first, your immunoglobulin um, uh, IgM antibodies, and some days later, your immunoglobulin G or IgG antibodies appear, and the amount of infectious virus starts to decrease. So at this stage, at this particular period, uh, there is an advantage. You know? The advantage is now shifted to antibody testing. So if this is the first encounter with the particular virus, that is, it is the primary immune response, your 
IgG antibody levels can stay at a relatively low level. So IgM yung mas nakikita when there is a primary immune response. So whereas in a later contact with the same antigen, so when there is a reinfection or virus, reactivation, the secondary response, uh, there is an increase, rapid uh, uh, increase in the levels of your immunoglobulin G. And uh, while your IgM response may not be detectable at all. Other considerations that are important, especially with antibody testing, are the following. So your serological diagnosis or your antibody uh, diagnosis based on antibody um, the presence of antibody is usually based on either the demonstration of the presence of specific IgM antibodies, which indicates acute infection as shown in the previous slide, or a significant increase in the levels of specific uh, IgG antibodies between two samples um, collected shortly after the onset of illness, that is um, referred to as an acute serum, and another collected two to three weeks later called your convalescent serum. So in the latter, where you need to compare no, your paired specimens, um, the diagnosis based on this approach is said to be retrospective. Because now you're, you've collected acute and then you've waited for two to three weeks in that time point or in that um, uh, duration, the, the patient could have already recovered. So that's why the diagnosis using this approach is retrospective. Now, Antibodies can be quantitated by several means, and the most common method is to dilute the serum serially in appropriate media and determine the maximal dilution that still yield detectable antibody in the test system. So the highest serum dilution that uh, retains specific activity is called the antibody titer. Lastly, the evidence of specific recent infection is most reliable when definite evidence of seroconversion is demonstrated. And um, this seroconversion means that there is detectable specific antibody. The specific uh, antibody is absent from the acute serum, but present in the convalescent serum. So that's a very uh, high evidence that uh, it is a recent infection. But alternatively, no, um, a uh, fourfold increase no, or a greater increase, fourfold or greater increase in antibody titer supports also a diagnosis of recent infection. So, for example, in your acute um, uh, acute serum, ito yung nakuha titer, and then at the convalescent, it's fourfold or greater increase, then you could also um, make the diagnosis that it is a recent viral infection. Now, um, as mentioned earlier, there's a great deal about diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. So let us define this you know, because these are very important when it comes to any diagnostic test, not just your immunoassay. So your diagnostic sensitivity of a given test is expressed as a percentage and is the number of individuals with the disease or infection in question that are identified as positives by, positive by the test. You know? By positive by the test divided by the total number of the individuals that truly have the disease. So this happens, or this we should be um, measuring this because there are um, uh, the test could give us false negative. You no, know, the, the 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 patient or the samples are truly truly have the disease, but it tested negative in the test. So that uh, constitutes or refers to as the diagnostic sensitivity of your immunoassay. In contrast, your diagnostic specificity of a test is a measure of the percentage of those without the disease or infection who yield a negative result. So uh, it's specific because um, they are true negatives. No? And um, a problem here is that we consider is that uh, the test label them as positive. So these, um, we are accounting for false positive in, when, we, when we think of your diagnostic specificity. Okay. So, whereas your both your diagnostic sensitivity and your diagnostic specificity are fixed percentage intrinsic to the particular diagnostic assay, the predictive values you know, of an assay is affected greatly by the prevalence of the disease or infection in the test population. 
So the positive uh, predictive value of a test is the probability that a person is infected when a positive test result is observed. So yun nga, no? So um, how how sure are we if the test comes up positive the the patient is truly positive okay? and then the negative uh, predictive value of the test man is the probability that a person is not infected when a negative test result is observed aside from this diagnostic sensitivity and diagnostic specificity as well as your uh, positive and negative predictive values we must also take note of the analytic sensitivity and specificity of a given immunoassay. So the former, your analytic sensitivity measure, it is a measure of its ability to detect small amounts of antibody or antigen. No? So yung limit of detection, kumbaga. On the other hand, the analytic specificity of an immunoassay is a measure of its capacity to discriminate the presence of antibody directed against one virus versus another. So this, um, we have to measure this because there is a phenomenon of cross-reactivity. So um, we, even the, our monoclonal antibodies are specific for an antigen. Remember that there are viruses that uh, belong to the same family and there's a probability that uh, their antigenic determinants may be similar. And hence, those monoclonal antibodies um, that could... Uh, could detect the uh, antigen of a specific um, a family member where your antigen of interest belongs. So it could also uh, turn out or could also give a positive results. Now we have employed different, um, I've discussed no, yung mga immunoassays, the considerations, but um, as a takeaway point, no, what that uh, um, as I near my uh, the end of my discussion, uh, in the clinical settings, no, we employ different methods depending on the goal of the clinician. And I would like to take a very good example in the management, the diagnosis and management of hepatitis B infection. So uh, you may know, no, if we want to know the status of the patient with regards to infection and immunity to hepatitis B virus, we order your hepatitis um, uh, B surface antigen as well as your anti-HBS um, antibodies. So, but knowing the disease course as shown in this slide, no, uh, it's very busy, but um, you will notice here that there is a window period no, during the time, the course of the disease when both your um, what I've said earlier, your uh, hepatitis B surface antigen and even your anti-hepatitis uh, B surface antibodies are um, not detectable. And at this specific time point, no, the only detectable and that could give us a hint that the person is infected with hepatitis B is the detection of anti, um, antibodies of IgM immunoglobulin class against the hepatitis B core antigen. So it helped us in ascertaining the infection. And um, it is not shown in this uh, graph, but for those uh, patients that have chronic hepatitis B infection, there is utility also in quantifying the, the hepatitis B DNA. So as, in, as a conclusion, your viral diagnosis uh, is an extremely dynamic and rapidly changing field and with tremendous progress has come new challenges. So, so with, with the increasing complexity of test options, the speed of methodologic change and discovery of new viruses and therapies, it is imperative that the clinicians and laboratory professionals consult the latest literature, work together and communicate to optimize patient testing and result intervention. And as a uh, um, mentioned about hepatitis B virus as an example, no, we the understanding of the disease course, its pathophysiology and the immune response, no, it guides us to the right choice or the most appropriate testing that could give us the information about uh, the presence or not of the infection. Now, uh, as also uh, shown in your hepatitis B virus as an example, there is a combination of tests that is uh, being used, no? hindi lang isa. We, there's a lot of um, debates about having to use RT-PCR alone or antibody testing or antigen testing. But I think um, as we uh, understand more the pathophysiology of your SARS-CoV-2, your COVID-19,
in we would see that uh, we would need the combination of these tests no so that they would give us more information they would be more relevant in the clinical setting and lastly of note um, of course we are developing a lot of these tests but um, the access no the um, availability of this test um, if it is not available and if it is costly then it would not be useful so we have to ensure also that the ac access to this test should reach to those who are in need of it and here are my references and with that i end my presentation thank you for your kind attention thank you so much mom Frest, for that wonderful talk um also, Ma'am Frest has agreed to give us a copy of uh, her beautiful slides. We will uh, post those uh, slides uh, sa ating uh, MC website, yung ating pong repository. No? And so those uh, of you who are teaching immunology or medical microbiology can uh, take advantage of uh, Ma'am Frest's um, presentation today. Before we proceed to our next talk, let me remind everyone that we will have an open forum at the end of uh, the next talk. So please type your questions in our chat box. Our second and last speaker today obtained his BS and MS degrees from UP Los Baños and his PhD from Osaka University. He then went to the University of California, Riverside for his postdoctoral research studies. Prior to his current position, he was a senior scientist at the Institute for Environmental Health, a food testing company based in Washington, where he developed molecular and amino assays for various foodborne pathogens like Salmonella and Campylobacter, to name a few. At present, he is a research scientist and scientific program officer at PATH, a nonprofit global health organization that aims to solve the world's most pressing health challenges. To share with us his expertise and personal journey in developing immunoassays for COVID-19, here is Dr. Jason Cantera. Thanks, Dr. Mom Carlos, for uh, the introduction. <clears throat> uh, let me share my slide. So hello everyone. So my name is Jason Cantera and uh, I'm a scientific program officer at PATH uh, Diagnostics Program. So first I would like to thank Dr. Raimundo for the invitation and the chance to talk about our COVID related works at PATH. So this is the outline of my talk today. So I will briefly introduce our organization, our program, and then some of our works on COVID-19. <clears throat> So I want to spend a little time today telling you about PATH, who we are, and what we do. So PATH is an international nonprofit organization with headquarters in Seattle, Washington. So it is a global team of innovators working to eliminate health in, uh, in, inequities so people, communities, and economies can thrive. And at our core, we believe that uh, better health moves people forward. So when people are healthy, they can work, they can go to school, focus on the future, and build better, more successful lives. That's why we focus on saving the world's uh, most pressing health challenges. So together, uh, we are driving public health solutions that meet the most pressing needs of families, communities, and countries. <clears throat> so we accomplish our goals by spe uh, specializing in five areas, vaccines, diagnostics, uh, drugs, devices, and health systems. So for diagnostics, we create affordable, portable, easy to use diagnostics to obtain fast, accurate results so that patients can get the right care at the right time. <clears throat> so examples of our work across these five platforms can be found in our websites so of pth.org. <clears throat> So the next few slides will provide a snapshot of our uh, diagnostics program. So our team is quite diverse. So currently there are 32 plus people 
uh, in our group that includes scientists and research uh, technicians, health experts, business persons, public uh, pro uh, project managers, and uh, administrators. So together, our team advanced diagnostic uh, innovations that guide clinical decision making, support surveillance, and inform health policy development. So PATH co-creates products and enab uh, enabling technologies in our laboratory and shop to accelerate product development. We also employ user experience research to understand the users and their needs and translates them into insights that guide product design, development, and uh, introduction. So we work with private sector partners to support commercialization through <clears throat> to a product launch and uh, market introduction. So we accelerate product development in our multipurpose workshop and biosafety level two research laboratory. So with our in-house R&D capability, our team conduct product development, rapid prototyping of different uh, diagnostic tests uh, with user-centered design. We evaluate and perform usability studies, pilot manufacturing, technology transfer, and uh, failure modes and effects analysis, uh, just to name a few. So our diagnostics has extensive experience across different types of uh, molecular and uh, immunodiagnostic platforms. We work with different companies, government labs, and academic partners. So we also work across uh, several diseases. So a big focus for the program is on malaria, tuberculosis, and neglected top, uh, tropical diseases. This year, due to the pandemic, our focus was shifted to COVID-19, but slowly we are returning to our regular programming. So on to our topic. So we all know that COVID-19 disease is caused by coronavirus, or specifically the severe acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. We all know that this disease has rapidly spread across the world from Wuhan, China, and affected millions of people worldwide and make us to remain in our homes. So there's a lot of information on the disease, or SARS-CoV-2, in the internet. So just a heads up, this presentation will focus on our uh, behind the scene works on diagnostic test development, and I will not be discussing vaccines, drugs, or treatments. So in today's pandemic, reliable, early, and accurate diagnosis of the disease is very important. So I listed here some of the important, or oh, uh, some of the uh, importance of this diagnostic test. So unreliable or inaccurate test may give false negative test result that may lead to uh, the spread of the epidemic in the country or in the community. So likewise, the false positive result may lead unnecessary treatment and mental trauma to the patients. So there is an urgent need to have accurate, rapid, readily available and reliable diagnostic test for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So to date, hundreds of immunological and nucleic acid amplification tests are developed. Others are still in development, including virus integrated point of care molecular devices. So this data was mined from Fines Diagnostic Resource Center. So the link is uh, underneath here. And this uh, center provides information, updates, and progress on different diagnostic tests, including the CEIVD, our FDA UA. Uh, EUA marks and other regulatory uh, organizations. So when I uh, pulled this data from their website this week, there are over 300 commercialized RNA and antibody-based diagnostic tests and about 60 plus antigen detection tests. So about 90 tests are still in development phase. So the US FDA has a similar list along with two other uh, organizations. And uh, I can send the links if anyone is interested uh, knowing what these uh, different tests are. <clears throat> so despite of this test, 
Testing is still lacking globally and more significantly in low and medium income countries or LMICs. So for instance, in the African continent on average has tested less than 0.1% of, uh, of its population despite the available testing capacity. Okay, so let's talk, uh, let's now talk about science. So earlier, uh, earlier Dr. Klimakosa gave us uh, snapshots of the different tools to diagnose or detect the virus. So today, let me provide a quick overview of the biology of the SARS-CoV-2 as it relates to diagnostics. So figure uh, A here shows the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 virion. It has four structural proteins, uh, the spike or S, the membrane or M, the nucleocapsid or N, the envelope or E proteins. So the N protein or the nucleocapsid, uh, nucleocapsid protein uh, holds the RNA uh, genome. The M protein here is involved in membrane uh, integration, while the E protein uh, facilitates assembly, envelope formation, and budding. The S protein here is involved in viral attachment, fusion, and entry. So this is the one that binds to the host receptor <clears throat> on, the surface of, on, on the surface of the host <clears throat> as a mechanism to enter the cell. So um, there are two important components of the S protein. One is the S, uh, S1 that contains the receptor binding domain that recognizes the receptor. The other uh, component is the S2. So this is the one that's attached to the membrane and it uh, mediates a fusion of the viral and host membranes, therefore allowing a viral entry. So the membrane, the spike and the envelope proteins uh, together comprise the viral envelope. So other non-structural proteins that are not included in the list are the proteases, uh, the helicase, and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which are, import, uh, which are all important for uh, viral replication and um, uh, translation. So in figure B shows the viral entry methods and replication of the SARS-CoV-2 in the host cell. So many uh, S proteins cover the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 and bind to the rece uh, cell receptor, uh, the ACE2, or the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It's a mouthful. Um, and that mediates a uh, viral cell entry. So um, when uh, the virus binds to the, uh, the ACE2, so using these mechanisms, so vi uh, the virus enters via uh, endocytosis, and then inside, or once inside the host, <clears throat> the, uh, the cell membrane is, um, you know, uh, disintegrate, releasing the virion. So the other uh, mechanism of entry, uh, entry is um, when the, uh, the, viral, uh, the virion attaches to the uh, ACE2 uh, here. So there's another uh, component molecule here, or the, the serine protease, the TM uh, PRSS2. So this cleaves the spike protein, allowing the viral membrane and the host membrane to fuse, releasing the, uh, the RNA inside the, uh, the host. So once inside the host, the RNA is being transcribed and the, pro and the protein is produced, and then there's viral assembly, and then there's viral release. <clears throat> so, the entry of the virus into the host cell triggers stimulation of the, uh, the host immune response. And um, it is a cascade of reactions, but eventually the humoral uh, immune responses are stimulated, the B cells are activated, and the antigen or virus-specific antibodies are produced. And the antibodies produced are generally uh, IgM and IgG. So with regards to diagnostics, the SARS-CoV-2 can be detected or the, or the infection diagnosed by detecting the genome, or in this case, the RNA, the protein, antigens, and the antibodies produced by the uh, host immune response or produced by the host immune system in response to viral infection. 
Okay. <clears throat> so one way to direct uh, to detect the viral RNA is through the molecular testing or PCR. So detection of the viral RNA indicates ca uh, current viral infection. So these tests are being used to diagnose cases of COVID-19 and are still an essential part of contact tracing and testing. So PCR test for SARS-CoV-2 has been uh, available since January, two days after the virus was identified. So it goes with saying that uh, if you have a sequence today, you can have a PCR tomorrow. So PCR-based testing is sensitive and accurate. Some are uh, agnostic that use uh, standard PCR equipment. And um, these days, real-time PCR machines are very common in research labs or even in clinical settings. It is high throughput, automated, and there's also the capability for data storage and distribution. There are also uh, automated point-of-care systems that exist. So those are the ones with smaller footprint or uses a <coughs> isothermal amplification technology, but they have limited distribution at a global scale. So some uh, drawbacks of the method includes the need for a lab uh, laboratory space or the need for infrastructure due to the PCR equipment. So the method is very prone to contamination, particularly if done in an uncontrolled environment. Testing requires skilled staff, and most requires sample extraction step. And uh, it takes longer turnaround time to get the result, depending on the method or the... So for instance, depending on the method or the platform, running the PCR takes a minimum of uh, 60 minutes, not including the sample preparation step. So because of the uh, huge global demand, access to reagents and consumables may be challenging for this type of test. <clears throat> so another way to, direct, uh, to detect the SARS-CoV-2 is through detecting the, uh, the antigen. So antigen detection test is for direct detection of the virus. So it uses antibodies specific to SARS-CoV-2 proteins, such as the spike and the nucleocapsid proteins. There are several different formats, like the high-throughput liquid immunoassays, like ELISA, or the single lateral flow immunoassay, as in the figure, which is uh, sometimes known as lateral flow test, lateral flow assay, immunochromatographic uh, uh, assays, dipstick, rapid test or test strip, and uh, five other terms that's being used to describe this test. <clears throat> so in this uh, rapid or lap, uh, lateral flow assay, a sample is added to the sample pad, and the sample migrates to the conjugate release pad where an antibody specific to the analyte has been immobilized. So for SARS-CoV-2 test, the analyte is uh, the viral proteins. So the antibody is labeled, this antibody is labeled with a particular uh, conjugate, typically a colloidal gold or a colored uh, fluorescent or latex particles. So this antibody conjugate is sometimes referred to as the detection antibody as it carries the conjugate that is being detected or visualized. So this is labeled with colloidal gold, for instance. So the sample, remobilizes the dried conjugate. And the analyte, or the virus in the sample, interacts with the antibody uh, conjugate as they both migrate to the porous and nitrocellulose membrane. Okay. So on the membrane, other analyte-specific antibodies have been immobilized or laid down uh, in bands where they serve to capture the target analyte and the antibody conjugate as they migrate up the capture, uh, as they migrate up the strip. <clears throat> as such, these antibodies uh, on the captured line are referred to as the capture antibody. So again, there's a detection antibody and there's a capture antibody. So if present in the sample, the viral protein 
will re uh, react with the antibody conjugate and the complex will aggregate in the test line. And the aggregation are seen as uh, red lines here. <clears throat> so the excess reagents move past uh, the captured lines and are entrapped in the absorption pad. So that's what the purpose of uh, this, uh, this pad or the wick. So the results are interpreted as the presence or absence of lines and can be read either by naked eye or by using a reader. So this type of test is uh, specific because of the nature of the antigen antibody interaction. The test is uh, also easy to use and can provide results in minutes as compared to uh, the PCR testing. So this is robust and can be manufactured at scale. And as compared to other tests, this uh, is uh, cheap. So the main drawback of this kind of test is its sensitivity, because this is not as sensitive as the molecular test. <clears throat> so uh, the antigen detection test usually targets the nucleocapsid uh, protein or the end protein because this is the most abundant uh, viral protein, which means that it's easy to detect and therefore it could improve the test sensitivity. So another target candidate is the, the viral spike protein because for coronavirus, this protein is the most divergent and therefore more specific to the virus. So in terms of specificity of the antigen test, the more unique the target, the lower the odds of cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses, thus reducing the false positives resulting from immunity to other coronaviruses. So for this test, it is important to use better for uh, performing antibodies, uh, particular, uh, better if they are in pairs, because as you will see in the next slides, not all antibodies are created equal. So uh, indirect uh, detection. So this is sometimes referred to, or an antibody test or serology test, is a blood test that can detect if a person has antibodies to the analyte. So in a lateral flow assay, for instance, uh, the antigen or the viral proteins is usually produced in the lab using the cell lines and then gets incorporated in the strip or sometimes labeled depending on the configuration or the format of the test. So uh, uh, it's in the strip to detect if the antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 are present in the sample. So this is uh, different from uh, uh, the antigen test. In the antigen test, the antibody is uh, on the strip and it detects the antigen. Here in serology, the antigen is a main component of the strip and it detects the antibody. So the COVID-19 antibody test can help identify people who may have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus or have recovered from the COVID-19 infection. So it has similar benefits as um, <clears throat> the antigen detection test. It is easy to use, robust, can be manufactured at uh, scale and uh, low cost. It is also multi-purpose. So it can verify that vaccines are working as intended during clinical trials. It can also be used in contact tracing weeks or longer after suspected infection in an individual. It can also help inform public policy makers how many asymptomatic cases have occurred in a population. So some drawbacks of the test is the vir uh, variable sensitivity and specificity, or sometimes Zero conversion of infected individuals is not yet well understood, or the antibody levels may wane uh, or may wane uh, rapidly. And lastly, production of antigens uh, to use in the assay or the diagnostic test is often challenging. So at PATH, one of our goal or our COVID work, our goal is to support the development of uh, effective rapid tests through screening the antibodies, providing access to qualified specimens and to ben uh, benchmark uh, assays for COVID. <clears throat> 
So to contribute to the development and manufacturing of a rapid direct antigen test for detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2, we screen different uh, antibodies. So in the initial phase of uh, the development process, there are numerous uh, spike uh, antibodies are being produced by different groups or different companies. However, there is no telling which antibodies have the potential for developing a rapid test. So our role in the project is to rapidly screen a handful of antibodies from different collaborators and vendors and to identify pairs that are most reactive to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2 antigens. So by doing this, it will, uh, we will help uh, support or enable the development of rapid tests for SARS-CoV-2. So today, I will be presenting my data towards the identification of those best performing antibody pairs. So <clears throat> I use a multiplex uh, immunoarray platform or the MSD or the Mesoscale Diagnostics Platform. Uh, in short, I will be referring to it as MSD uh, to screen the antibody candidates. So the assay is a typically or as, uh, a typical sandwich uh, ELISA procedure wherein the capture antibody is coated onto the wells, the antigen or sample is added, followed by detection antibody, and then the substrate. And uh, also there are also uh, washing in between each addition of those um, uh, reagents. The difference of this uh, assay with ELISA is of course the cost of the plates and the reagents are not cheap as compared to ELISA. <clears throat> Detection antibody has electrochemiluminescent label that allow for ultra sensitive detection. The plates has electrodes at the bottom of each micro, uh, plate wells and when electricity is applied to the plate electrodes by the MSD instrument, light is emitted by the labels. And the light intensity emitted by the labels is, propor uh, is proportional to the quantity of, an uh, of analytes in the sample. So um, we collaborated with a company in Vancouver, uh, Canada, to obtain um, S antibodies that were generated via selection of the B cells from the COVID-19 patient uh, who recovered. So at that time, they were advancing their antibody generations for SARS-CoV-2 using their proprietary technology. I also procured additional antibodies from two different commercial uh, vendors. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, those antibodies are not yet listed in their product catalog. They're not even sure whether they're good or not. So in total, I had 28, oh sorry, uh, 48 antibodies <clears throat> that uh, I screened either as capture or detection antibody. And I used the trimeric uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, the in inactivated SARS-CoV-2, and cell lysates or even clinical specimens. So in the preliminary evaluations, a recombinant trimeric S protein, which is expressed from insect cells, was used to screen the antibodies as at that time it was the most accessible. So trimeric spike or trimeric S is a full length S protein including the S1 and the S2 regions. So the, anti uh, the antigen, when used in the assay, resulted in the generation of very low electrochemiluminescent signal uh, at the concentration used. So we postulated that um, a post-translational modification <clears throat> may be different in insect cells when uh, the if the, uh, the protein is expressed in mammalian cells. So luckily at that time, three other companies made available their own versions of the spike proteins. So I tested all four recombinant S uh, glycoproteins across a range of dilutions <clears throat> using one good antibody pair that generated the strongest ECL in the preliminary screen. So the signal intensities and the curve varied with respect to each of the three antigens used. So the mammalian cell derived recombinant S protein from one uh, company, uh, the AB company, produced the strongest and the most consistent signal as compared to 
uh, insect derives uh, insect derived uh, antigens. So this antigen or the AB trimeric spike antigen was used or selected for use as a standard in all antibody screening. <clears throat> so before assessing the antibodies in pairs, I test each antibody in a direct ELISA format to at least gauge if all antibodies recognizes this trimeric spike. So the graph on the right shows the varying responses of the different antibodies to the trimeric spike as antigen. Some antibodies react strongly to the antigen and about 40 to 50% of the total number of, anti of antibodies I, uh, I screened <clears throat> are non-reactive to target. So just these two results alone highlights the fact that antigens from different sources as well as the performance of the different um, antibodies to the same antigens vary considerably. So ex therefore, extensive characterization of these reagents is necessary for test development. So this is a strategy I use in screening the antibodies. So due to the availability of the antibodies at that time <clears throat> and the urgency of the work, the antibodies were screened as they come in, which is a bit uh, challenging. So this is a bit uh, noisy slide. So, but I wanted to I, I want to highlight here that I started off with uh, 41 antibodies from one company, screened them in pairs for a total of 1,681 pairings, and from that pairing, seven antibodies, when paired among themselves, stood out that seven antibodies were screened in uh, round two with three new antibodies from commercial vendor um, B and then we screened with four additional antibodies from a third, vend uh, third vendor uh, in round three. And then the top uh, pairs were then assessed for detection limits, the ability to detect inactivated SARS-CoV-2 variants, for cross-reactivity to non-target but related viruses and also tested on clinical specimens from uh, COVID-19 patients. So this is um, the result of the round one screen where in the 41 antibodies from uh, one company were assessed in both capture and detection uh, or detector format. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this is in a matrix array for each antibody combination. So in the absence, <clears throat> sorry. So in the absence of a positive control assay, so the ACL values from each array spot in each well were norm normalized based on the percentile of signal to noise in each plate versus the spot with the maximum signal to noise produced in each plate. So the color gradient here represents the performance of each antibody pair. So from top to bottom are the antibodies as capture and from left to right are the detector antibodies. So the color gradient here <clears throat> uh, represents the performance of each pair measured as signal uh, minus background. So the darker um, color here indicates a pair that performed uh, better. So for example, the antibody 447 here as capture worked well with antibody uh, 277, uh, uh, 291, and so on and so forth. So a total of 117 antibody pairs produce at least 25% uh, of the maximum signal that are marked in blue. So from that initial screen, I selected 20 captures and 23 detection uh, antibodies, and then tested them in pairs for a total of, four, of 460 combinations using um, the same S protein at 10, 100, and 1,000 nanograms per mil to confirm the initial results. The x-axis here are the, um, an the antibody pairs, well, uh, the y-axis is the ECL signal. So 10 antibody pairs that generated the highest ECL signals were selected, and that includes two capture antibodies and five detect, uh, detector antibodies. 
and uh, those seven antibodies were advanced through uh, the next round. So in round two of screening, the seven antibodies were then again assessed with three antibodies from company B, the MM43, uh, D003, and um, uh, MM57. So it was cut off uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, the screening was done using eight-point dilutions of the S protein to establish the standard curve and estimate the limits of detection of the antibody pairs. And our results indicate that this, that um, our results indicated that um, these antibody pairs resulted in higher ECL uh, signals and lower LODs than the best performing antibody pair from the initial screen. So we have a good antibody pairs uh, in the uh, second uh, screening, but the limit of detection is still, eh, we're still not satisfied with this one. And with the acquisition or with the procurement of four additional antibodies from company uh, C, we again screen them with all these antibodies. And eventually we come up with one pair that has a very low limit of detection and very high signal intensity. So, so far the best uh, performing pair is this uh, L2355, uh, L2215 combination that can detect as low as um, four picograms per mil of the uh, uh, spike protein. <clears throat> So next is to test if this antibody pair detect the virus. So the pair was challenged with a titer inactivated SARS-CoV-2 resulting in the generation of a dose dependent uh, curve. So the X axis here is the concentration of the irradiated virion in terms of the genome equivalent versus the ECL or electrochemiluminescent signal. So the estimated limit of detection for this uh, antibody pair is 2 TCID 50 per mil or approximately 7.4 times 10 to the 3 genome equivalents per ml. <clears throat> so this limit of detection is below the desirable analytical sensitivity <clears throat> as per the TPP published by the uh, WHO. So this is, uh, we meet or this antibody pair uh, meet the, uh, the TPP requirement. So the cross-reactivity was also evaluated for this antibody pair by challenging the pair with coronavirus isolates, including inactivated MERS and SARS uh, variants, along with human coronaviruses OC43 and the 229E at concentrations uh, equivalent to 10 to the 4 TCID 50 per mil or about 10 to the 4 plaque forming units per mil. And as uh, shown in the inset here, the antibody pair didn't show any cross reactivity with other human coronaviruses, indicating high specificity towards the SARS CoV 2. To demonstrate, uh, the assay performance of this uh, antibody pair 2355 to 215 uh, with clinical samples. A panel of 53 the identified clinical samples comprising of 20 COVID-19 negatives and 33 COVID-19 positives by RT-PCR were used to challenge the assay. So of this, <clears throat> 44 of the samples, so this and this, were correctly identified as either positive or negative by this antibody pair. So there are nine uh, RT-PCR positive samples, each with a cycle threshold of over 29.5, were incorrectly scored as negative by the antibody pair. <clears throat> Overall, the assay using the best antibody pair using standard assay conditions without optimization, so had a sensitivity and specificity of 73% and 100% respectively when compared to the RT-PCR results. <clears throat> okay, so um, to summarize on our candidate, uh, our, our um, antibody screening, 
So candidate antibodies to S protein of SARS-CoV-2 that may be suitable for development of uh, lateral flow uh, immunoassay antigen detection test were identified among the 48 um, S antibodies. So a parallel screening of uh, N antibodies using lateral flow assay approach was completed by our collaborator who is now developing the LF8 test using both the, uh, the N pair that they identified and the S antibodies that uh, we identified in this work. So while the S protein is less abundant than the N protein in SARS-CoV-2, there might be some uh, utility for combining the S and the N uh, protein as targets to create highly sensitive multiplex amino acids with its uh, additional distinct epitopes uh, that will enable uh, improved accuracy, especially at lower LOD. So for our purpose, so a developing a biplex amino assay. So this is not the lateral flow assay, but a biplex amino assay based on the MSD platform using both the S and the N antibody pairs. And we intend to use the biplex assay to characterize the specimens in our COVID-19 uh, biorepository. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is another uh, work that we're doing uh, at PATH. So um, access to specimen panels and essential reagents is one of the key challenges in developing diagnostics, particularly during epidemics. So this kind of challenge delayed the development and evaluation of critical diagnostic technologies, leading to poor detection and control of the disease, poor patient outcomes, and increased disease morbidity and uh, mortality. So to support and accelerate the development and validation of in vitro diagnostics, PATH has created a biorepository of COVID-19 clinical specimens through grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So our biorepository includes clinical samples of nasal swabs, tank swabs, serum, and plasma. So these are all the identified clinical samples that were collected during active community transmission as part of routine clinical care. So limited samples are also available from a longi uh, longitudinal cohort, and our team is also working to generate contrived spike samples with an inactivated virus to support early research and development efforts for nucleic acid and antigen detection assays. Mm. So uh, in response to the need for these specimens, we are also developing and uh, validating our in-house reference methods for SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein detection to support our specimen characterization. So uh, again, our protein testing is based on the, <clears throat> uh, the S and, and protein antibodies that we screened using the ultra-sensitive array platform, while the molecular testing uh, that we're using is based on the CDC RT-PCR methods. So those two methods <clears throat> will allow the correlation of the viral load and antigens in this uh, clinical samples in our biorepository. It will also, or they will also allow characterization <clears throat> of these specimens after storage and handling as compared to clinical testing results. And um, there's also potential to assess the antibody response uh, profile once we analyze this um, uh, serum and plasma from longitudinal cohort to better understand how the uh, antibody response or how the antibody uh, respond uh, during uh, the infection. <clears throat> So uh, this last of my slide, thank you for your attention. Maraming salamat, Dr. Cantera. Also, please extend our gratitude to PATH for allowing you to share your research data with us. Okay. So papalakpakan ko yung ating dalawang speakers. Yan ating virtual palakpak. Okay, so now the floor is now open for 
question for your questions. Uh, sabi po na ating technical team, pwede daw po kayong um, diretsyong magtanong. Pwede naman daw pong i-unmute. So, uh, I'm checking the group chat right now. We have a question from Dr. Hill Penuliar. Sir Hill, you can unmute yourself if you want to um, ask your question directly. Sir Hill. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, yes, so thank you for uh, to both speakers for the very informative webinar. So recently, the Department of Health released uh, an omnibus interim guideline for uh, COVID-19, which includes uh, detection. It was released just this October, but the interim guideline does not recommend the use of rapid antibody tests for uh, seroprevalence surveys, um, return to work decisions, and um, entry to country policies due to uncertainties over uh, accuracy. So my question is, uh, what does this say about the utility of, ro of rapid antibody tests in detecting COVID-19 in the Philippines? And second, if these tests have FDA approval and have passed FDA standards for diagnostic tests, why are there still issues over their accuracies? Thank you. Uh, I guess um, <clears throat> what I comment on that one is that um, at this point, so test developers, so uh, masyadong naging mabilis yung production or um, yung development ng um, uh, different tests, right? That's for, uh, for one. Uh, usually, kapag ka develop ng different tests, you need to uh, have the right uh, material to begin with. So, katulad ng ginawa namin, uh, the different antibodies for rapid testing and also the materials that they use to test their test, right? So, at that time, wala pa masyadong ganong uh, materials. So, probably, it was too rapid Devel uh, uh, their development of rapid test is too rapid to begin with, so hindi pa masyadong na um, na ma validate because they have uh, they don't have the materials uh, to validate their test. That's why uh, in yung naging uh, naging project namin to provide or to create the biorepository that we can share to the test developers to evaluate their test and kapag ka hindi maganda yung resulta dun sa panels na bibigay namin. So it's like their test field. So hindi siya available, dapat gamitan. Next time. Um, um, just Chris, like, do you want to comment? Yes. Thank you. I agree with sir that um, there's a few, there's the development of the rapid test is really rapid and there's a few uh, validation study that are being conducted. And um, Maganda nga yung ano yung um, initiative nila that there is a biorepository no um, I hope that we could have also here in the Philippines and um, it could help a lot no in the validation studies that are being performed in not just the antibody tests but also siguro antigen and even other um, platforms of RT PCR mm -hmm. you would but um I think uh, one of the major concern regarding dun sa mga claims about uh, it's low um, sensitivity or accuracy um, in the COVID-19 um, uh, diagnosis is, as I've said in my slide, yung timing also, not just the specimen, mm -hmm. timing, the collection of those specimen. When did um, those uh, specimen were collected, when those patients were um, tested using this test? Kasi nga, um, as I've said, at the very early stage you cannot uh, you cannot detect antibodies talaga no lalo na kung maliit or kung yung limit of detection um nung antibody test would be uh, it needs large amount of the antibodies mm -hmm. no? so um yun nga yung right uh, specimen the right time no you would see naman in other studies also when they stratify the analysis from first week second week and third week you could see the utility of your um, antibody testing in that sense. No? So, yun yung uh, 
tiko doon sa issue na yun. So, um, sa ngayon, we also um, we also see the value doon sa um, research nila, sir. Kasi um, there's a lot of monoclonal antibodies that are part of this um, uh, mga rapid test, no? And we have to screen nga which of those are um, uh, would yield no? na magandang intensity and uh -huh. good sensitivity, analytic sensitivity, and so forth. Uh -huh. So, Kaya maganda rin yung efforts nila. No? At least ito na-identify na natin and may candidates tayo. And we could move forward with that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in addition to that, meron yung mga uh, studies na ginagawa na yung sampling, um, uh, sampling materials, like uh, mga swabs. So hindi rin, iba-iba rin yung kalang performance. Like uh, I think sa ngayon ginagamit yung Copan swab. So yung iba kasi, ibang uh, swabs ang ginagamit and sometimes hindi na elute doon yung yung virus or yung uh, antibody or uh, sorry uh, yung antigens so yon so uh, meron meron din kaming research na ginagawa to evaluate the different uh, sampling methodologies to improve the sensitivity of those tests and uh, we also have another uh, effort in the laboratory na hindi ko lang na uh, isama is to benchmarking those te uh, benchmarking tests just like um, um nag identify kami ng mga uh, diagnostic tests ipapadala sa lab namin and in the lab we evaluate or we assess the performance of their test in terms of the detection sensitivity and all that stuff using our um, panels in the repository so, ganun yung mga ginagawa namin uh, work uh, in the lab, again, to support uh, these um, uh, technology developers. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you, Sir Hill, for your question. Okay, we have other questions here. Can you please unmute yourself, Mr. Jeffrey Warges? Mr. Jeffrey Warges, you can... Unmute yourself and ask your question directly, if you wish. There might be a technical problem, so I'll just read his question. It's about the saliva test. Um, any update on the development of the saliva test for detection of COVID-19? If I remember correctly, this was um, developed by a uh, research team at Yale University. So um, he has an, a further question on that. Wait lang po. Okay, what diagnostic method is being used for that particular test? Okay. Uh, Sir Jason, do you want to answer first? Uh, do you know what group uh, developed this test? Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with this test, saliva test. I'm it's sorry. It's group at Yale, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, okay. Mark Press? Maybe I could um, answer that question. Um, in there's an ongoing um, study, Philippine General Hospital, regarding this uh, saliva testing. No, it's an uh, rapid antigen testing. Okay, so that's the method that I know that they are testing. I'm not sure if that is uh, developed by Yale, but there's a lot of others also that are venturing into this um, form or type of uh, immunoassay. But um, right now, um, I think that they are commissioned to, to validate this, uh, this rapid antigen test. The, the one that I'm speaking of uh, is the one um, having their study in Philippine General Hospital. So they are still recruiting now. No, so they uh, there's uh, there's no results yet regarding that. Thank you, Mom Fres. Tama ba, Mom Fres, yung nabasa ko minsan about that? Because uh, I, I got very curious. Yung genetic material mismo yung uh, hinahanap sa sa laway. Tama po ba, Mom Fres? I think it's the antigen, if not mistaken, spike protein parent. <laughs> A spike protein. A spike protein pa Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Fares. Okay, we have other questions here. Let me just uh, call on Ma'am 
Socorro Parco. She has a series of questions. Ma'am Socorro, can you unmute yourself? Maraming tanong po si Ma'am Parco. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning ma'am. My question is on the virus and its characteristics. Firstly, uh, there is there is a concept in in maybe it's in immunology that when a, an agent passes from one immune host to another, it is weakened. Is this true for SARS-CoV-2? Okay. Um, hi, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, answer that. Well, um, I think what you have read is um, with regards to preparation of vaccines. So if your viral particles, you... Um, uh, incubate it and subculture it for many um, for many times no passing from one host cell to another in that sense uh, because the the media the nutrients that the virus needs to, to grow um, is provided then at, at some point after uh, multiple times of uh, subculturing the um, the virus could be rendered weakened but in human transmission no it's um, it's not probably the case um, most of the time uh, there could be yes it could lead to some mutation if there's a uh, high transmission rates but those mutation could I uh, could be a could render the virus more contagious or less so we we, we need more um, uh, molecular epidemiology to to show that those um, mutations could lead to a weakened uh, virus Okay, thank you so much. And probably because we haven't had vaccines and there's no immune host yet in the population. And my other question is, um, ko. <laughs> but sinulat ko yata dito. So you have answered the mutation thing. My other question is, are there any lab findings which has been related to clinical symptoms? Aside from the spike in the Ig? Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe it's also um, one thing to emphasize with, with regards to viral infections is that um, to diagnose the infection is to um, ascertain the presence of the virus or their uh, a certain there is a response to the as an exposure as a uh, as a result of exposure to the virus but along the way um kahit nakikita natin in disease states um even if the virus is already cleared in the body the immune system is still heightened it's still um uh, stimulated that brings the um severity of the disease into a higher level so and that's what we are seeing in SARS-CoV-2 infection, no? so meron tayong mga mild and moderate and severe. And those severe and critical patients, what are being seen are the, life, the, lab, the lab findings that we could call as biomarkers. No? Those biomarkers um, include a lot of um, immune status um, or immune factors. No? So there's, is, there is a great um, role of post-immune response with regards to this uh, clinical symptoms, disease severity in SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. And aside from that, there are persons who are asymptomatic and that yet they test positive. Mm -hmm. And I wish that our DOH will give us the data on that because that is that will abate our fear, you know? <laughs> thank, but thank you. Thank you so much, Ma'am Parco, for your questions. Okay, so um, we still have time for, I think, one or two questions. I'd like to call on the screen Mr. Ryan John Pascual. 
I think you have a question for Dr. Cantera, Mr. Pascual. You can unmute yourself. Okay. Baka meron namang technical issues. I'll just read this question instead. Okay. Next to accuracy, accuracy question of affordability. Can you give us an idea on this? Can you also give insights on the value of knowing the serial pre prevalence in the population in the pandemic response? Again, that's a question from Mr. Ryan Pascual. Dr. Cantera. Um, okay, so first, uh, in terms of the cost, so uh, affordability of the, uh, the test. So at this point, we don't know uh, yet uh, with our uh, what we're doing. Uh, for example, is our development of the um, RDT. We still haven't done with our um, market assessment. Kung magkano ba talaga yung, yung rate na ma-afford ng mga user. Siyempre, depend, uh, depend yun sa mga countries or sa end user or sa countries kung saan gagamitin yung cost, kung ano yung ma-afford nila. That's one. <clears throat> uh, but for our purpose, for example, yung ginagamit lang namin as reference assay, so uh, since it's a lab-based, so uh, and if you're the budget, then depende kung ano yung masusupport ng budget niya. Uh, what's the next question? Actually, sir, uh, Dr. Cantera, mm -hmm. I, I, we have a question, I think, from Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, sir Frank. Sir Frank, you can unmute yourself. You're raising your hand. Uh, yes, good, uh, good, good morning. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentations. Um, there are so many immunoassays that are being uh, produced and commercialized and have been given, um, especially from the US, US FDA, um, emergency use authorization. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's really something for, for the Philippines, for example, that uh, we still make use of our RT-PCR uh, test as the gold standard. Now, um, I know that immunoassays are, are rapid. Uh, they're, they're more um, probably cheaper. But uh, I would like to ask if at what uh, level of specificity and um, um, yeah, sensitivity of these immunoassays uh, in which we can, we can say that uh, th this would be acceptable uh, mm -hmm. as diagnostic, uh, diagnostic assays, because that's really the concern, um, the, the accur accuracy that is sacrificed um, when we use uh, many of these immunoassays now. So mm -hmm. the question is at what level of specificity and um, sensitivity can we say that we, we have, uh, the level is acceptable? Mm -hmm. So uh, good question. So actually uh, the World Health Organization uh, released the target product profiles uh, for priority uh, diagnostics. So this is uh, to support response of the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. So merong uh, target pr uh, product profile na nirelease ang WHO and uh, I can send uh, the, um, the link to you guys. Uh, and then makikita nyo doon kung ano mga recommended um, sensitivity or specificity. So for instance, in terms of, okay, I'm pulling it now. So the limit of the analytical sensitivity or limit of detection, so the, uh, the acceptable uh, range is equivalent to 10 to the 6 genomic copies per mil, and the desirable is about 10 to the 4 genomic copies per mil. So, uh, and then there's uh, analytical specificity. So the data is already there. So um, I can send um, uh, the information to you. Okay, if thank you. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Frank and uh, Dr. Cantera. Okay, um, is um, Terence Ferdinand Nagano still around? He has a question here. I think uh, Mom Fres can answer this one. Um, sorry. Uh, before I answer that one, can I, okay, I give my insights on the on the question regarding the value of knowing zero prevalence in the population? Sure, so, ma'am. 
in the in my slides i said that yung antibody testing or zero prevalence uh, study rin yon um uh, it has three um main reasons why we perform antibody testing first is um we want to know if there's exposure second if there's a acute recent infection and the third is the response to vaccination so with regards to um its its value no we are going to be um starting the WHO solidarity vaccine trial in the Philippines. So um, that zero prevalence study, antibody testing, and other uh, immune factors that are really needed to see if those are issues, those vaccines are effective. And then, yeah. Can I read the question now, Mom Press? Um, it says here, my ongoing research Uba sa COVID testing na similar to fourth generation HIV testing. I haven't heard of fourth generation HIV testing. Let me see. What can you be specific about fourth generation HIV testing? Good morning, po, Doc. Um, Terence, po. Um, hello, po. Kasi po, um, fourth generation testing, di ba po? Um, yung um, recent um, more commonly known HIV testing methods test for the antibodies in blood. Um, the fourth generation, po, it shortens the window period um, by it's a combo test for both antigen, the P24 antigen in the capsid structure of HIV virions, and also the antibodies present in blood. So, kahit po nag peak na at nag decrease na yung um, um, vi um, virus load sa blood, but detect pa rin po siya kasi meron pa rin pong antibodies. Thank you po. Mm -hmm. hmm. I think I have seen one um, study, but I have not followed it. Pero yeah, they're they're testing both antigen and antibodies. Pero um, I think it's qualitative, no. So at again, it depends. The result I think depend on when would be the samples collected, no. Kung um, yung ako first week ba ng illness, second week of illness, then uh, we will see different patterns of those um of those uh, results dun sa test na yon. But I, 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 I have a knowledge that there is one that is testing both antigen and antibody um, against SARS-CoV-2. And I think it's a platform of rapid test also. Thank you, Doc. Chromatographic acid. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, nag-alarm na po yung aking timer. Pero bibigyan ko ng... Um, ng uh, Halaga itong uh, ating tanong na nanggaling sa ating beloved MC Chair. So directly from Ma'am AKR, last question. What happens when the antigen has mutated? The antibody formats won't be able to detect the antigen? So galing po yan kay Ma'am AKR. So uh, maybe both of you can give your thoughts on that, on those questions. Thank you. I think it will depend on where the mutation took place. If it, did, uh, if it didn't affect the, uh, the binding site, then it will still be uh, um, uh, detected by the antibody. So, uh, siguro depend talaga sa positioning ng you know, uh, mutation. This may take on that. Ma'am Press. Sorry again, ma'am. Can you repeat the, the question? What mm -hmm. happens when the antigen has mutated? Would the antibody formats be able to detect the the virus or the antigen? Uh, it depends, no. So, um, as I've said in my uh, in my talk, um, there's a specificity in antibody and antigen interaction, but uh, it's not too rigid, no. It's um, it it may allow some flexibility, no. Kaya rin there's uh, cross reactivity. So, depending on the the mutation, if if it really um, changed drastically the the exposed epitope, then I would not be surprised if that antibody against or produced from uh, against it would not be uh, useful anymore. So um, I would like to note that um, those um, viruses that have antigenic um, uh, variation, no, katulad ng influenza. So, um, antigen detection is not really recommended 
to to use for those uh, kind of viruses. So we we need to again we need to understand more of the virology as well as the immunology of of these things so that we could um, have the um, most appropriate choice for testing. Thank you so much to our speakers. So, napakaganda ng ating um, Q&A portion. Napakaraming tanong. Kaya lamang po, in the interest of time, no, um, siguro po ay pwede niyong um, tanungin ang diretsyo sa kanilang mga email ang ating mga speakers. Bonnie, can you please flash the slide containing the email ads of our speakers? Ayan. Ibigay po sa atin ang kanilang email address. Ayan. So take note of those um, email addresses so that you can um, direct your questions to our wonderful speakers today. So our heartfelt gratitude to our speakers for finding time today and enlightening us about the many facets of antibody testing. To further show our appreciation, our beloved PSM President, Sir Joel Kernista, will present the Certificates of Appreciation. Sir Joel, the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma'am Miller. Okay. The Microbiology Consortium of the Philippine Society for Microbiology Incorporated would like to present their Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Frestel Monica Climacosa, for sharing her time and expertise as resource speaker on the topic, overview of antibody testing for the diagnosis of viral infections during the online seminar on antibody testing and development of rapid diagnost diagnostic tests for COVID-19, delivered via Zoom the 17th day of October, 2020, signed academician Asuncion K. Remundo, the MCC chair, and myself, P, uh, PSM President. Thank you very much, Dr. Klimakosa, for your time and that very informative lecture. It's a pleasure, sir. The same certificate of appreciation is given to Dr. Jason, Jason Cantera for sharing his time and expertise as resource speaker on the topic development of immune assays for COVID-19 screening of antibody for more sensitive detection of the SARS-CoV-2 during the online seminar on antibody testing and development of rapid diagnostic tests for COVID-19 delivered via Zoom on the 17th of October, 2020, signed academician Dr. Raimundo K., uh, Dr. Asuncion K. Raimundo and myself. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Cantera, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Maraming salamat muli sa ating mga speakers. Bising busy sila. So talagang nakakatuwa na um, nakapagbahagi sila sa atin ng kanilang oras ngayong araw na ito. And to cap this morning's program, let me call on the screen our beloved MC Chair, Dr. Asuncion K. Raimundo. Ma'am Sean. I think there was another certificate supposedly to be given to the moderator. Hindi na na-award ni Joel. Anyway. <laughs> ma'am, sabi ko po kay Sir Joel, wag na po. Na uh, okay, ano ma'am? na lang daw, ma'am, during our meeting. <laughs> Kami na okay. lang po. Yun, ma Thank you. Salamat, okay. ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, webinar, the fifth of a series of webinar conducted by the Microbiology Consortium of the Philippine Society for Microbiology. The Microbiology Council would like to express appreciation first to Dr. Jason Cantera, flew all the way from Washington, buti na lang via Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> we thank him so much. He, uh, Dr. Cantera was our student. He was uh, then our colleague, and later, inaanak pa sa kasal. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> We are glad that he, uh, he, he has a successful career in the U.S., but he always helps whenever we ask him to give a seminar or review a paper and all that. So we still call on him to help us out in the microbiology community. And thank you to Dr. Klimakosa, who came highly recommended by the diva of immunologist, Dr. Nina Gloriani, 
when I asked her who can she recommend to give a overview uh, lecture on antibody. So Dr. Klimakosa is one of a kind. She has an MD and has a PhD. So thank you for sharing with us your expertise on the antibody. And thank you, of course, to Dr. Prof. Carlos for uh, moderating the seminar and to Dr. Tevez for the closing uh, remarks. Now, one important announcement for microbiology consortium members. I hope they are there. The microbiology uh, consortium website is now open for your use. Okay, but this is uh, uh, a website for microbiology consortium members only, as uh, has been announced uh, before. The user's name and the passwords are already with the microbiology consortium uh, coordinators in your region. So either you will contact them, him or her, or she or he will contact you to give you your uh, name, user's name and password. We stated there in, in the website that uh, uh, there are copyright issues. You're not supposed to edit or copy without the permission of uh, the authors. If you want to use them, you are welcome to use them, but you have to use them in total. No cut, no uh, editing of any of the materials that are posted there, but you're welcome to use it for your uh, classes. Um, for those who are called provisional members, because they haven't uh, signed the memorandum of uh, agreement, and have not yet paid the membership fee, you'll be given a certain period to use the uh, website. But after that, we will change the password. And, uh, yours. You have to sign the MOA and pay the uh, uh, fee. Okay, so I hope that is clear to everyone. The other thing that I'd like to share with you is that we're trying to populate the website. So if you have pictures of the different uh, activities that the Microbiology Consortium conducted in your regions, please send them to the to Bonn or to the Microbiology Consortium uh, email so we could uh, post them in the Microbiology uh, Consortium website. Okay, so I hope you will be able to use them for your uh, instructions. And if you can, if you want to add something to the website, you're most uh, welcome. So thank you everyone and have a good day. Till next webinar uh, series. Bye. -bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.